So actually, last year, last year we asked the speakers, all the speakers, to be here in the morning at uh, nine after the reception, and we had some complaints. That, well, you know, that's not fair. And also some guys that were not so, well, crystal clear to explain the content of their talk. <laughs> exactly. So, are you ready? What? Je suis pas branché. Ah, lui, d'accord. Ok. Merci. Ouais, ouais. Ok. So let's start with the speaker pitches. So 10 seconds. Well, hey, let's say 15 seconds because 10 seconds it's really, really <laughs> too short. Sure. Yeah, no, no. You say beep after 15 and they have uh, two seconds to finish. Okay. No, no, you go. Okay. So you are the first one. I can't catch. Uh, Boris Adrian, tomorrow morning, 9:15. Why research programmers and programming scientists should get recognition and most importantly training. And I'm going to show some ridiculous examples of my coding skills. Hi, I'm Natalie. Uh, tomorrow I will be speaking about application user interfaces. And if you think that usability is about applying a bunch of principles and rules, then come tomorrow, 10 Argos, because Dave and I have something to tell you. Interesting applications of modern merging tomorrow, Argos, 11.05. Hello, I'm Akos, uh, tomorrow 10 at Diamant. If you don't like when guys go out to have a coffee break or, or just smoke due to the fact that the computer is crunching on the models that you are processing on transforming, come to see us and I will give you a talk about incremental transformations. 10 at uh, Diamant tomorrow. Thanks. Hello, uh, tomorrow 11.05 in Diamant, I will explain why my team no longer needs to do any null pointer checks and why we have been writing much less code in general lately. Uh, hello, I'm Nicola, and tomorrow at 10 here, I uh, will speak about uh, OpenAB, aka uh, Eclipse Smart Home, uh, not from a developer point of view, but uh, from a very enthusiastic user. Uh, point of view uh, with uh, uh, using it in a <laughs> living lab uh, <laughs> Hello, I'm Santan. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9, just here, we're going all together uh, per programming, modifying the same file, uh, Java file, for instance, uh, with uh, Eclipse J, Eclipse Orion, Eclipse Flux, and Eclipse ID. See you tomorrow. Hello, I'm Pierre. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9, I will try to explain a bit more what is exactly Cura and how we can use it uh, quite easily to implement a smart uh, IoT application connecting a Bluetooth low energy sensor to the cloud. So you're welcome. Hi. So tomorrow I'm going to give two talks. So I guess I got 20 seconds. <laughs> so. Uh, first talk in the morning, um, I'm going to speak about model execution. Uh, how can you bring simulation into your modeling environment? <laughs> Basically, we're going to make some virtual LEDs blink, just like it would blink on your Arduino. Then, in the afternoon, I'm going to present the new and not worthy of Series 3.0. So I'm going to speak about usability regarding diagrams and large model scalability. Thank you. See you there. Thank you, guys. So, Ignite Talks. So, I think that initially it was an idea of Benjamin or Michael, or both, Benjamin. So we did that 
since uh, first year, so that's third year now. And uh, last year I was in charge of it and I did it very badly. So this year uh, all, the, all the slides are on the machine and the, the principle is that it runs automatically. And yeah, yeah, I, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. So as a principle is that uh, you have five minutes to describe your topic in 20 slides. And so that's uh, something very uh, fast and uh, yeah. And actually, last year, the guy who made me screw up with, uh, the, at the beginning of the Ignite Talks is, uh, was Olivier. And uh, we gave him a second chance because he, he always talk about nice, uh, nice topic, but that's your last chance too. <laughs> okay, so first one is uh, OSLC with Mathieu. Yes, that's me. Go ahead, Mathieu. Okay, so you all know that it's a difficult exercise. Um, where do I start? But I can cheat, I, I can talk without starting the no, slide, no? Okay. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. Yes. So my name is uh, Mathieu Elbois and I'm a software engineer for Thales Corporate Engineering. And I will talk to you about OSLC connectors, why do you need it and how to do them. So there is two news. There is, uh, a bad news, I won't be able to make a demo because uh, I don't have a lot of time, but the good news is it will only last for five minutes. So if you're not interested, don't worry. So SLC, what is it? Uh, the goal is to do data and tools integration with uh, open specification and in using the web uh, technologies like REST and RDF. You may be using OSLC without even knowing it. For example, the MyLink client could be considered as a change management uh, OSLC consumer, and you can have adapters on top of Bugzilla or Jenkins and so on and so on. Okay, let's just take a simple scenario. You have a wonderful workbench to do system engineering, like Capella, and you want to link a system function to a requirement. How to do that? With OSLC, you would basically um, expose two resources, one resource for your system function with some RDF stuff, and one resource for your requirement with also some uh, RDF statement. To do that, you will have to write two OSLC providers or consumer, one for architecture management on top of Capella and one for the requirement tool, for example, Wikecycle. But uh, there is a lot of functionalities in OSLC, and you would have to do a lot of functionalities to implement them, like dedicated UI, authentication, queries, and so on, and so on, and so on. So to help you do that, there is Eclipse Leo, which uh, an Eclipse project, of course. It's an SDK to help you write some consumer and provider, mainly in Java, but there is other languages. There is also example, reference implementation, and even test suite to test your, your consumer. But yet again, you have a lot of code to write because you have a framework, but you have to write your own connector by yourself. Mm, it's, not, it's a lot of work. So the idea was to provide some tooling to help you define a model representing your connector, to provide also a generator which will help you to, in fact, generate the code of your connector. There is some benefits to that because you can validate, uh, of course, your definition of the connector. If someone improves something in the generator, you will have an improved connector. If some spec is changing, you would just have to regenerate your connector. But you still have, in fact, to write specification. And in the case of Capella, there are a lot of meta models and things to understand. And so we came up with some accelerators, which will automatically, and you can modify it later, but will help you according to the meta models to define the specification. But after that, you would still have, in fact, to uh, 
write some code in the connector. For example, you would have to load your models by yourself, unload the models, uh, map the EMF queries to the OSLC queries, and so on and so on. So to do that, once again, uh, the tooling is helping you, for example, to uh, make some dedicated UI more simple according to the meta model or the EMF model. After that, you can see that there is also other benefits to this approach. For example, it will also work for some viewpoints, which are, in fact, Kappel extension with new DSL, or you can use this tooling also for other modeling workbench. Of course, you just have to define and generate. The status of this work, yes, there is, uh, my boss is not here, so I can say it. There is uh, still a lot of work to do, uh, like documentation and uh, some Garrett uh, things to approve, but it's in a good shape. Uh, this work uh, was done uh, mainly by KTH, Thales, and Atos uh, in some several European projects, and was provided, is provided, in fact, in the Eclipse Lyo project. Uh, so if you have any question, you can contact me, or Tristan from Atos, he is there, I think, or you can ask Google, which is your best friend, I think if you want to know how to generate a no SLC connector. Thank you. Thank you. I think you, you don't really need to hold the bottle for the, the world's pitch, that's okay. <laughs> that was just for the speaker pitches. So next one is... Uh... Yes, Equinox by Serban Constantin. Where are you? Here you go. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, hi everyone. I'm Sherban Constantin. I'm a product engineer for uh, Freescale Semiconductors. Um, what we do basically is we manufacture integrated uh, circuits for auto, communications, consumer electronics, and we also write enablement tools for our hardware. This is the CodeWarrior IDE. It's an, an Eclipse-based, and it's optimized for Freescale hardware. This basically means that we take Eclipse, and on top of it, install all our stuff. Um, this means that we rely a lot on customizing the whole install flow of features and so on. Basically, we have one base Code Warrior stack, on top of which we apply customizations for each of our different branches. So we have uh, custom compilers and custom debuggers and so on, but everything is done via install new software, so we are all using the Equinox P2 provisioning. This means that in order to fully take advantage of all the stuff we have to do, we had to write some custom update reactions. Uh, they are mainly done to extend the provisioning platform and due to custom requirements of having binary data outside of the Eclipse folder and so on. So the main one, the first one was Freescale install. This was uh, similar to native P2 install action. If you've ever installed the feature, you know how that goes. Only we place binary outside of Eclipse. We do some file checking overwrite, and we first copy the binary to a temporary location and then move them to the destination to make sure that everything is safe and we can revert. After that, people told us that, hey, due to all the checking and so on, the, your install action is a bit slow. So we came up with the copy action, which is uh, an unsafe one because it basically doesn't do any file in use checks. We basically take the data, dump it in the location, and that's it. Um, I usually, as projects go on, people start using your stuff, and then they come with requirements like, hey, I installed your feature, you put your data on my computer, then I said, you know, I don't like that. So I hit uninstall, and oh, look, your data's still there. 
So management comes and says, okay, you need to make a remove action to delete everything. Um, we also have execute actions because we have a lot of binary and custom executables, so we need to run different provisioning scripts and so on. These are platform agnostic, meaning we can run them on all supported platforms. We do all kinds of uh, verifications for exit codes and combined with the install and copy, we, do, we can do complex deployments. A lot of our configuration stuff is based on XML files, so we also extended P2 to have actions to automatically merge XML files, so we basically provide a patch set and we tell it, okay, this is the new content, you need to add it to the file and it automatically manages to do that for us. Um, after that, some people decided that, hey, we know that some stuff isn't necessarily locking, but we would like to know if it's running in the background. So we had to design a mechanism to check if a process is running, and if it's running, we need to tell the user, hey, it's running, you should probably close this instead of going on with the install. And this was made so that we have full control over the background of the system before doing our custom deployments. Speaking of custom deployments, this is a completely weird case specific to, I guess, only us. Uh, in case you want to have two separate Eclipse installs, but you want to keep them in a sync, you need to deploy plugins. So say I install a piece of software in one of the Eclipse installs, we want to automatically update the other one as well. This was done by taking advantage of the reconciler drop-ins directory and running some scripts in the background to notify the Eclipse that the platform has changed in both environments. And that's about it with uh, extending P2 for fun and profit. Thank you. The next Ignite talk is fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Sorry. Antoine Thomas of Bonita Soft on gamification. Donc ça va aller. Faut juste appuyer là. So hello, I'm uh, Anton Thomas, so I'm community manager at uh, Bonita Soft. I'm also Ubuntu Studio co-founder. So in this presentation, I will speak about how you can implement uh, some gamification into a community or an, an appli uh, for your community or your application. So I will just use um, the example of a, a famous sport, so soccer or European football. Uh, I will demonstrate how Stack Overflow is doing that, so I guess you all use Stack Overflow. And um, so if you look at the stadium, on the center you have the stars, the leaders. So actually the people that all the staff on the border of the field uh, are training and take care of. So uh, you can think as the staff, as the community managers of soccer community. And all around you have people who are actually just watching the game. Uh, so it's a huge amount of people, not only in the stadium, but also watching the game on TV. So. If you look at people who are not professional, uh, but very active in the community, uh, you can create rank between them for they have the latest t-shirts, they pay cable TV to watch the game, they go to the stats, they have a lot of knowledge. It creates a kind of gamification between them. And the second part of community member in the soccer game is people who really play. So uh, people who really play, uh, it starts with little kids in this game, uh, you have a, a, a complete system around uh, to identify who will become a star. It starts with uh, local clubs, regional clubs, uh, professional teams, but you have also uh, the local championships, all the cups and medals they get. And this system helps the staff, the professional teams, to identify the stars. So. How can we place that uh, on a famous community like Stack Overflow? Who use Stack Overflow here? Who is going to Stack Overflow? 
who is actually contributing, writing stuff, question and answer. So that's the point. Nearly no one. So most of people are actually just watching the game. They come to Stack Overflow to watch question and answer, and we call them lurkers. So that's the part very difficult to identify. And Joel Spolsky, uh, Stack Overflow CEO, said, actu says that actually people do not participate more because of the gamification. It just helps to identify who are the leaders, who play the game, who are contributing. So this is my profile on Ask Ubuntu. It's another Stack Exchange uh, platform. And it helps to understand what is the business model of Stack Overflow. It's recruitment, human resources. So, their job is they earn money by displaying job offer on the right column. And all you do when you are active is attracting people who are not active. So if you want to create a gamification on your community, first of all, it's easy. Highlight the leaders. You can create points and badges based on basic action like content creation. Sorry, content creation. Don't, for, don't forget to create negative points sometimes and special right access uh, based on, on amount of points like uh, moderation rules, edition, stuff like that. And special stuff like uh, providing them with gifts uh, and blog interviews. The difficult part is to identify lurkers. So if they are connected, logging in your website, you can use badges. For example, when they view 50 uh, questions or uh, 100 answers and stuff like that. But you can also use Google Analytics or special system based on cookies and plug that to your legion because actually most of your customers are lurkers. So your sales representative would like to see what those lurkers are looking for on your community. The last step, of course, is to add fun. So how it goes? Create lists so it's easy to understand who gets a badge uh, or and create a, a great user profile with detailed activity and stuff. It, have, it has to, to, to look really great and fun. Had some what the fuck stuff. It's easy. Just do a kind of brainstorming with some alcohol and cool guys, and you will find some really good ideas of crazy badges to add. Again, it's not about just only legion, but Keep that in mind. So at Bonitasoft, we are doing that on community.bonitasoft.com. So we are doing that with a Drupal distribution. It's PHP. I know that it's not your stuff at all. But if you want to try it and even contribute, you're welcome. So it's available already. And we will migrate on that this summer. So thank you very much for watching. I know, I know. It would be better if it works uh, up front. No, no, oh no, the screen yes, is not yes, coming. Yes, yes, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no oh. email, no emails. And, okay. Okay, so this is an idea I talk about uh, again, a uh, gen model add on. This is a project that could help you to manage your code used uh, um, that you generate with um, with EMF. So um, this tooling, um, I, I want this tooling to <coughs> to apply good practice for model-driven development. Actually, there was um, an interesting uh, article written by <coughs> Sven, uh, who is the leader of Fixed Text, who said that uh, if you want to uh, manage your generated code, you should not mix your generated code and your developed code or your overridden code. So this is one of the first principles. Another one is that you should not uh, deliver your generated code. You should generate it uh, on the fly when you get the project. Um, of course, if you have Java code, you, it's better to, um, to override the code using inheritance. And you must also, so that's other um, issues like to have clean code because you will have to debug it and you have to test your, generate, your, your code generation. So I will focus on, um, on the part of the, um, on the separation of the two, uh, two parts of codes. Um, if you use EMF, uh, you probably know that it's, it generates for you a grid code 
with, uh, that you can use, of course, in your application. But usually people uh, override the code using the add-generated annotation. So, so it's a little technical, but uh, if you don't know EMF, I know that you know, don't know this stuff, but it's for EMF users. And you have also some tooling like mine, for instance, that, that, that can help you to identify the, the overridden methods, for instance. But if you do that, you mix everything, and it's not always easy to, uh, to know how to, to deal with your code. So actually, if you want to apply these practi uh, best practices, you should create a new source folder, you should create a new EMF factory, you should extend the factory override, ext override extension point, and then you should write uh, a class on an interface for each class you want to override. So that can be um, a lot of work if you have a lot of class in your model. So I started a project for, to, to help you to, to generate this code. This, this is uh, hosted on GitHub on this URL. So if you just search on Google Gen Model Add-on, you will get this page. And there is um, an update site to uh, install it. So actually, this, this uh, tooling will generate for you um, in the source directory, you will have uh, the templates of the code you should have to, uh, to apply these this best practices. And it, all this code inherits from the generated code generated by EMF. So in this case, you have two separate uh, folders. If you want to try it, uh, there is an update site that you can, uh, you, you can download it from the, um, the main page of the project. And um, when you restart your Eclipse, you will have an additional menu, generated dev, uh, where you can generate the, de the derived um, source folder. Uh, actually, it will um, analyze the gen model file uh, that you have selected when you open the, the menu. It will find the values you have set inside this model. And then you can set here the values you want to, to have for your uh, specific development uh, folder. So in this example, I just renamed all the model classes, the generated model classes with the M. So when you launch the application on this project, for instance, where you have an inheritance, you will get, so I cannot enter in details, but you will get the, the, exactly the inheritance you are expecting even if you override some interfaces. And something interesting too is that you can keep your, in your code the usage of the project factories, uh, over the, the X factories you have, uh, you, you have to use when you have um, an EMF project, so with instance. So this is exactly the same code when you use it because the factory has been overridden. Uh, 15 seconds, so that's okay. Uh, <laughs> So, to sum up, this is the, the URL of the project, and if you have any questions, you can ask me using this email. So, thank you. Four seconds. Thank you. I was about to run to yeah. unplug your, uh, your laptop. Yes. Okay. So, as I said before, today is uh, the day for the mass release. And we have the chance to, uh, to, to have Wayne with us. So Wayne Beaton is the director in charge of open source projects at the Eclipse Foundation. And I, we, we decided to give him more than five minutes because we think it's important for the community. <coughs> and so Wayne, go ahead. No? Okay, no, oh. good, good to go. Uh, yeah. All right. So, um, Mars has already been released. Uh, I, I, before I begin, I, I, I got to let you in on, I, I thought I was going earlier in the day. Uh, so, we'd, uh, we'd arranged that uh, I'd have all these live feeds of, of people working on Mars, and we get to, to actually see them push the button that, that causes the release. Um, so I need you to pretend that the release didn't happen. I need you to pretend it's a little bit earlier in the day, and I need you to pretend that you believe me that this is a live feed. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, here we go. So this is a live feed from the Eclipse Foundation offices. This is uh, Webmaster Matt working away. And that button there on the table is the button we push when it's time to do the release. Now when this button gets pushed, and we have to wait a few minutes, we're still about 15 minutes away from the, uh-oh. More volume, please. More volume, please. Okay, so uh, we should be, this, all the, we're a little bit too early. We're not quite ready to be pushing out the bits. Um, I actually have some people standing by live. Uh, I hope that they're ready. Uh, I'm, yee, it's, oh, oh gosh. Uh, yee. Uh, yeah. Who's the prettiest buddy? Who's the prettiest? More volume, please. You can do this. You're still Eclipse Lynn. You're good enough. You're a marketer, so it doesn't matter that you're not smart enough. And yesterday, when you tweeted that photo of your breakfast, two people liked it. What the? Is this thing on? Am I live? No! All right, so it looks like uh, Matt has, uh, has recovered uh, that. Um, hopefully they're undoing the damage that was done by Eric hitting the button. Uh, and I guess it's time for me to start uh, my talk. Um, so uh, Eclipse Mars is our 10th simultaneous release, and we couldn't be uh, more excited. Uh, it's 10 years of shipping on time, uh, which I think is pretty amazing for any organization. Uh, it is a testament to the dedication of those involved. Uh, I'd like to sort of make a, just make a shout out to uh, David Williams, who does an incredible amount of work uh, on, on preparing the simultaneous release and making sure everything gets, get, uh, gets put together. Uh, Marcus Knauer, who puts the packages together. Um, they, these guys together do a great deal of work for the community and, and deserve a great deal of respect for that. 79 different projects join the simultaneous release. Uh, 65 million lines of code is our estimate. Um, we um, uh, had three new, pro sorry, seven net new projects joined, four dropped off. The new projects, SWT Bot, FX Eclipse, RCP Testing Tool, uh, Time, Trace Compass, Oomph, the Lua development tools uh, were new this year. We uh, had a lot of committers. Uh, one of the things I find is interesting is we wound up with uh, 352 contributors. These are non-committer contributors who uh, almost matched the number of committers we had involved. The contributors accounted for 4,000, uh, more than 4,000 different commits against the repository. Uh, on average, each contributor actually contributed 4,000 uh, commits. Uh, Ed Willink from the OCL project committed the most number of commits. Uh, Ika Stepper, who is here, uh, was I think third place uh, in terms of our oh, crap. Uh, in terms of the number of commits. So we've added Docker tools to uh, Eclipse. Uh, Max Anderson did an excellent talk about that a little earlier today. Um, so this, the idea is you can control your uh, containers and your images from Docker from directly within the Eclipse environment. I apologize for the quality of the graphic. Uh, apparently, uh, I did a poor job with that. Um, we uh, also did a lot of work uh, this, this time on an installer, Ika Stepper, uh, Ed Merckx, who are around here, did a lot of work here. Uh, it's actually kind of amazing when you think about it that we've gone as long as we have with Eclipse without actually having an installer. Uh, so this is new technology that we're pretty excited about and we want you to try it. I'm particularly excited about the advanced version of the installer, which lets you actually realize uh, an entire development environment, including, a, um, uh, including uh, Git repositories and Mylan tasks, uh, and a target environment. Uh, so it's, it's, it's great stuff. I invite you to take a look at the installer, look at the advanced uh, stuff. Uh, there's also some preferences propagation. This is a long-standing long issue with developers that use Eclipse. Uh, I have preferences. I want those preferences to be global. You can now do that with the preferences uh, recorder. It records preferences as you change them and then propagates them to other environments as you start them. So. So you can uh, tune your environments fairly quickly. One of the things that I find is neat about that is it's made me start thinking about my uh, Eclipse environments as far more transient. Uh, I make them very, I make them and dispose of them as I need because, of course, the preferences come along uh, easily, uh, basically for free. We also have some tools for Cordova. Cordova is the open source phone gap. Uh, this is a new project. There's some uh, some cool stuff in there. It's basically building phone uh, applications for iPhone, uh, Windows Phone, and and Android using JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. 
It's, uh, again, I've, I've, I've played with this just a little bit with the Android stuff, but it's, uh, um, it's all pretty, st pretty solid and good. Uh, Gradle support is actually not technically part of Mars. Uh, it's uh, released at the same time as Mars. Unfortunately, the build ship project didn't come to us quickly enough or soon enough to join the actual simultaneous release, but you can add great Gradle support to your Eclipse IDE directly from the Eclipse marketplace. You can actually drag and drop um, the uh, Gradle support uh, directly from the, uh, the new and noteworthy documentation or from the marketplace itself. Another feature that we've added that I think has uh, been pretty handy is the automated error reporting. Uh, this, uh, uh, when, it, when an error happens in Eclipse, uh, I know that everybody, uh, when they detect an error or see some error in their log, they create a bug report. Um, what we do is we do this for you automatically. Uh, it takes very little effort from you to uh, generate that error report and it uh, helps our developers immensely. At this point, we have um, fixed 277 bugs that we wouldn't otherwise have known about because of the, the uh, error reporter. There's a lot of different updates to the platform and actually this is the reason I have my book because there's so many of them I couldn't remember them all. Uh, so we have new Java 9, uh, sorry, 9, Java 8 quick fixes, pardon me. A recommendations engine, uh, the code recommenders is on by default. Uh, constructor completions, override completion. We have a new Java code formatter, improved flow analysis in Java. JUnit view, view usability uh, is improved considerably. Uh, lots of debugging and console improvements, including word wrap in all of the consoles. There's a Java 9 beta available from the marketplace. If you're going to use that, you actually need to have a Java 9 JVM running underneath your Eclipse. Tomcat 8 support, JSP and CSS editor improvements. Automatic updates are on by default. Uh, we're looking for that uh, interesting deluge against our servers. We'll see how that goes. Um, improved performance for updates. Uh, improvements in the dark theme. Uh, nested project view in the project explorer. A new launch bar. Text search has been sped up. Uh, the one that I've been holding my breath waiting for is the print button is now hidden by default. Um, max uh, heap size has been set to 1024 megabytes. Uh, there's been some great strides and improvement on GTK3. The Mac OS distribution is now an actual application bundle, so it acts like a proper Macintosh uh, OS X application, pardon me. Git flow support. Project import directly from Git, Git config Java work variables, and CVS has been removed from the packages. We now return live to the Eclipse Foundation office uh, and uh, Matt, who is putting the final touches on the Mars release and getting ready to, with great excitement and ceremony, hit the magic button that pushes out the Mars release. Congratulations Eclipse on your Mars release. Amazing work and of course another fantastic release name. Eclipse Mars 2015, hashtag crushing it. <laughs> now how do I turn this thing off? <laughs> hey, we're eating. You caught me on the back straight at Spokane Raceway. Can't believe it's been 10 years in Eclipse release. Awesome. Congratulations. Oh, hey, I gotta go, man. Keep it up, Eclipse. That's Jeff McCaffer, a longtime committer. Uh... Congratulations to all the members of the Eclipse community. Kim Horn, a longtime platform committer. Mars. It's been a great 10 years, and I look forward to seeing the next 10. Bye. Huge congrats to everybody in the Eclipse community on the 10th simultaneous release. Hey, what's up, Sam? I hear you're shipping Mars this week. Cheers! Cheers. <laughs> So those are all people who've been important parts of our community and have uh, moved on to other things, uh, but they still love Eclipse, they're still involved a little bit. But uh, anyway, that's all I have. Uh, thank you everybody for, for attending. Thank you uh, for helping us make Mars great. And uh, please enjoy Mars. And get, a, get an Eclipse account, sign a CLA, report bugs. We need to hear about them. And, and submit patches too, patches are cool. Thanks.